ready when you are, folks. Good luck, everyone. Good luck, Sarah. Thank you. I think I did it. Did I do it? Yep. Cool. Good luck. Oh, coming in. going to say, Matt, if you want to say anything, by all means, you can uh, say a few words. I'm happy for you to do the welcome, Seth. All Go. right. I'll, I'll make it happen. Wow. Nice. People trickling in. I feel like with these, like, I wish there was like the, the elevator music you know, in between. I know. Like, yeah, like, yeah, like yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. person, you'd like people to have the side conversations. It's like. I know. Uh, um, but yeah. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Welcome to day two of the HDO virtual Congress. Uh, I'm sure many of us uh, wish we were in person, but you know, we adjust to these times. And uh, for those that were able to join us yesterday, I hope you had a good and informative uh, group of sessions that you were able to attend. And, oh, I could say, thank, thanks, Dr. Bonnie. Yeah, she was saying I could sing. I don't know if you guys wanna hear me karaoke, but um, <laughs> for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Seth Rotberg. I'm helping out as a, one of the, what I call the dream team of, uh, Mod moderators for these sessions yesterday as well as today. Um, so shout out to uh, a few others who have been helping out. And I also come from a family impacted by HD. So it's exciting to, to be here and see everyone, uh, you know, learning and, and connecting with one another. And so before we get into it, you know, thank you again to the sponsors of Congress. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do it without you. Um, as you can see at the bottom, um, these are Several of them, you know, Roche, Wave, PTC, Spark, Unicare, Voyager, uh, Prelinea. And there, I know that there's many other people who have been involved from the beginning to make this work, what it is today. So before I welcome our amazing speakers, I do want to just mention just for everyone's purpose, um, I know we're going to be talking about the Roche H HD trial and just making people aware that if you are or you have a family member who is participating, um, the best way to learn more is to reach out to your uh, you know, trial site and reaching out to the person that is coordinating it from that end. Um, you know, the, for, for this purpose, you know, they're really just giving updates on, on the trial and sharing other relevant information um, that will be helpful for the HD community. So I just want to put that out there. So if you do have any specific questions regarding your participating in the studies, uh, you know, um, we please ask not to ask them here um, and to ask your trial site coordinator. So without further ado, um, we'll get into it. We have a talk with from Professor Sarah Tabrizi, um, as well as from Dr. Scott Schobel. Um, Dr. Scott Schobel is representing Roche and Professor Tabrizi is, is leading the Roche HD trial. We'll talk about the experience of the trial from the clinic. And then Dr. Schobel will share Roche's update on their HD treatment. So we do have an hour for the session, which is very exciting. Um, you know, the, the goal is to break it up by about 20 minutes for each speaker, followed by about 20 minutes for, for questions, uh, similar to the format of yesterday. And without further ado, uh, take it away, Professor Sarah Tabrizi. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can share your screen. Great, thank you. Let me um, share my screen. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes, I think we see it as, yeah. Rush Huntington lowering trial. Uh, it should say Rush Huntington lowering trial, a perspective from the clinic. Yes, you're good. Excellent. But um, we're, we're seeing it in presenter mode, I guess. Yeah, is that okay? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's up to you. I, we can see like how it says like the next slide um, and some notes, I think, as well. So ah, OK. No, that's all. <laughs> no, 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 no. It shouldn't be. Sorry. Gotta, gotta love technology, right? <laughs> Sorry, guys. No, I definitely don't want to um, show you it in the. Um, uh, that's. Uh, let me try and uh, let me escape, and um, I don't want to show you it with the, all the um, other bits. Um, let me try now. How's that? Perfect. Yep. Excellent. You did, <laughs> you did it. Wow. Thank you. So I'm enormously honored to be um, giving you this talk. And I wish I was with you all in person. And I wish we were in Glasgow. Uh, but uh, vaccines permitting uh, and science uh, helping us move forward, we will be able to be in person, we hope, next year. So I'm going to tell you about the Roche Huntington Lowering Trial, and I'm going to give you a perspective from the clinic. And really, it's an overview of what to what you would expect in the trial. And I think it's relevant for the Roche trial. I think it's relevant for all trials where um, uh, there is um, uh, lumbar punctures that are, are administered frequently. So you can take this overview as a learning about participation in a clinical trial that involves either the drug being delivered by lumbar puncture or having frequent lumbar punctures. So, so clinical trials are studies that have been designed to discover or verify the effects of one or more investigational me medicines. So the regulation of clinical trials aims to ensure that the rights, safety, and well-being of trial subjects are protected and that the results of clinical trials are credible and believable. The key aspects of clinical trials is you need to determine the benefits and the risks of a given therapy. It involves randomization into a group that receives either the experimental drug and a group that receives placebo. It is completely blinded. The investigators and the patients don't know which group they are in. And trials are voluntary and participation in a trial is an altruistic act. If you're in a trial, you're free to withdraw at any time, but there is, it is important to stay in the trial to the end if possible, because obviously the more patients that stay in the trial, the more likely that the trial will be able to tell us whether a drug compared to placebo slows progression of the disease and whether it's safe when compared to the placebo. The support of a study companion is important, but it's not essential. And I'm gonna come on and talk a little bit more about that. Now, before thinking about a clinical trial, it's important to understand that it's time consuming. Being in a clinical trial is a really high commitment from both the patients, the patient's companion and the clinical team. And so this is the assessments that are in the Roche phase three generation HD1, which Scott will talk about in more detail. There is the Huntington's daily activity scale, which is really asking how you do a number of things that are part of your daily activities, the total functional capacity, the total motor score, looking at neurological function. There's some psychiatric uh, questionnaires and there's a global clinical impression score, which is really the doctor saying how they think the patient is doing. There is also some thinking tests. And this is all done electronically onto a tablet. The assessments also involve blood tests, 
and some general medical assessments. And actually, this is a picture of a urine sample. So it also involves urine samples. One of the aspects of this trial is that it has digital biomarkers. And you've probably heard of digital biomarkers, but this is where there is a smartphone and a smartwatch, and it's very closely tied to daily activity. So there's questions that are questionnaires about behavior. There's also thinking cognitive tests. There's a symbol digit uh, a modalities test and a word reading test, which you do weekly. There's some upper body motor tests, which you do on the phone, which are tapping, drawing a shape, looking at movements, looking at balance, and that's all done on the phone. There's also looking at walking and a two minute walk. And the, also the phone and the watch together is looking at balance and movements and walking. And there is also passive monitoring because they're connected to each other of how people are walking around, how much movements they have and what's their walking like. And this is all uploaded through the internet to the electronic case report system, the ERT system. There's also, as I mentioned, um, some medical examinations, the cognitive tests are done on a tablet, and there's some neurological examinations. Really, this is important as well for safety, because we want to be absolutely sure that the, when the people come up for the assessments that we aren't seeing any new or abnormal neurological signs. There's also MRI scans, and many of you may have had an MRI scan where you go into the scanner for about 30 minutes. And the MRI scans are very important in this study. They're important for safety readouts, and they're important to see if the ASO changes, the changes in the brain that we know occurs in Huntington's disease. So from a patient perspective, I asked a number of patients what they felt about being in the trial. These are the factors that influence trial experience that came up. One of the patients said, the most important thing for me is the consistency of care and also seeing the same doctors and nurses every time I come up. The experience and help from my clinic I have always found my many years connected with the research clinic as being very positive. The very thorough teaching at the first consent stage was impressive. I understood properly what I was signing up to and what is expected of me. So when you come for your first visit, the consent um, that you do, which is called full informed consent, is a really big deal because everything is explained in detail, the pros and cons of being in the study, the time commitment of being in the study and what the study involves. Being known by name, by every team member in Gender's Trust. I also asked them about challenging aspects. They said, it is a serious commitment of time on behalf of the patient and companion, and you have to be really well organized, is a great aid. Another said, the only real challenge I would say are logistical, in terms of the schedule of treatment with work and life commitments and the location. For our patients, they have to travel into central London. Another said, I have sometimes been rather washed out and tired the day after dosing, probably due to the long travel. So I leave that day free of appointments and apart from a walk, make it a lazy day. And that works very well. I asked them about the importance of having a study companion. And this is someone who partners you through the study. A patient said it is very important it's best to discuss it with someone you know, maybe a loved one or a friend, just a family member, friend or other loved one. It's best to discuss it straight away with someone who also knows the every element of the day and timings. I find the companion takes away the pressure and keeps me relaxed so I'm a, I am at my best. 
my study partners helped me the most. I think it's really very important to have a study partner. Also, you've probably heard loads about lumbar punctures. And the, the Roche ASO drug is delivered by a lumbar puncher, which means it goes directly into the spinal fluid to reach the brain. And a lumbar puncher, I'm going to come on and talk to you about lumbar punctures, and I have a video which I'm going to talk th it through with you. So this is the video I'm going to show you about having a lumbar puncture. And it's been created with patients who've had a lumbar and this film is going to tell you what to expect when you have a lumbar puncture. It's also called a spinal tap. And it's a procedure to take a sample of a CSF cerebral spinal fluid sample. This also the spinal fluid is also how the antisense oligonucleotide gets to the brain. And this is the drug is given via this lumbar puncture. So before your lumbar puncture, you have to sign an informed consent that you know what to expect with a lumbar puncture. You're not allowed to take blood thinning medications. These are some of the ones that are mentioned. And this is always checked before the lumbar puncture and the doctor will always call you before your lumbar puncture to check that you're not taking blood thinning medication. You also have to have blood tests before the uh, lumbar puncture to check for your platelet levels and to check that your clotting is fine. You can also eat and drink before the lumbar puncture. Now, how do you do a lumbar puncture? The procedure is carried out by a doctor and takes about 30 minutes. You put on a gown, you're asked to lie on your side, usually close to the edge with your knees folded up. Sometimes doctors do it with people sitting upright, dependent on what's best for the patient. It's important to stay very still and the nurse will always sit with you and look after you during the procedure. First, the skin around your lower back is cleaned. And then the nurse or doctor puts in local anesthetic to numb the skin. It can sting a little, but this allows the needle to go in with no pain. And the needle goes in between the bones at the base of the spine and removes CSF. And then also the drug is then given through the same needle to deliver the ASO to the brain. It's really carefully done to take it from exactly the right spot. There's a feeling of pressure in your lower back when the needle goes in. But if you feel any pain during the procedure, you need to just let the nurse who's looking after you know. And I'm gonna tell you some of the experiences about people felt during lumbar punctures. People often feel anxious before lumbar punctures, but it's very important and what, one of the things that we do is that we allow people to bring in soft toys. They can bring aromatherapy oil. We play music. And when you have the ASO delivered into the spinal fluid, it is completely painless. When the drug has been delivered, the needle is taken out and a plaster is put on the back. After the lumbar puncture, you're encouraged to be active, but then you have a time to rest afterwards before you do any of further assessments or you go forward or even go home. It's important to drink plenty of fluids and the doctor and nurse are there all the time to be able to take phone calls if you're worried when you go home. 
So I'm now going to tell you a little bit about experiences that patients said about lumbar punctures, because people can be quite frightened of lumbar punctures. After having 14 lumbar punctures, I have no worries at all, no side effects, and straight up, I'm walking briskly for 30 minutes. Oddly, perhaps, I like the idea of the study drug being given by lumbar puncture. It meant a very high level of compliance from the subjects. You know you're getting the drug or the placebo through the lumbar puncture. I found the initial five or so lumbar punctures uncomfortable, but this was reduced with more experience. And I want to really emphasize that having the lumbar puncture can be, you, you, you can always say how you feel to the doctor and nurse, and the doctors who do the delivery of the uh, Roche ASO and the lumbar punctures are very, very experienced. So on the visit, you come along, you have blood taken to just to check how your clotting is. You get a visit by the doctor to review medications and side effects. You have thinking tests. You then have the MRI scan, and then you get given the Mo Roche mobile application. On day two, you have blood drawn again and you have vital signs. You have a neurological and physical examination. You then have the lumbar puncture and the drug administration, followed soon by a neurological and physical exam. All the assessments and lumbar puncture can be performed in one morning if there's no MRI and you can be finished by lunchtime. I asked patients about motivation. What keeps you in the trial? The most important motivation is that I've been given a chance to do something. My motivation comes from within. I really want to be able to help the wider Huntington's disease community. It's great to be part of very exciting research. The desire to aid research into treatments for HD for family members and generations to come. So I hope that gives you a short overview of what it's, be, what it's like to be in the study. I'm happy to discuss it in more detail and I'm happy to take questions. And thank you for listening. I'm gonna hand over to Scott. Thank you, Sarah. That was really great. And um, it's a real um, pleasure to be here. I'm going to share my screen now. And let me know that if that is going well. How is that appearing? Good to go. Great. So good day, everyone. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues from Roche and Genentech, I'm very pleased to provide uh, to this group um, a clinical program update. Uh, a big thanks uh, and shout out to HDEO uh, for the invitation to share our work uh, in Huntington's disease research. And uh, this presentation uh, contains general information about our program. It's not intended as any specific medical advice. Indeed, we are testing an investigational medicine, which is not approved by health authorities. Um, so essentially what that means is that we're right now, as Sarah has outlined, studying the effectiveness and safety of this molecule. Um, and please, uh, for any specific health-related questions, please talk to your healthcare provider for any specific information or advice about any condition, including uh, any current or potential treatments. I'd like to introduce Roche. Uh, outline for you our approach, provide the update on the clinical development program, and then with Sarah, happy to take uh, Q&A. In case you haven't heard of who we are, uh, we are Roche uh, Genentech. Uh, Genentech is the U.S. Uh, branch of the global Roche company, um, and we are all about pursuing uh, groundbreaking science to discover and develop medicines for people with serious and life-threatening diseases. Uh, we are mainly known as an oncology company in recent uh, decades. However, uh, we're sort of coming back uh, strongly, we think, uh, into the neuroscience uh, realm. Uh, we're very privileged uh, to be um, what we uh, feel uh, is at, at, at a place of uh, nexus between many elements of the community. Uh, that includes um, patients and families at the center of everything we do. Uh, we have um, a couple of individuals on our steering committee who are pa a patient, uh, a family member, um, and a gene-positive individual. 
uh, we have um, a lot of great interaction with people such as Sarah and others in the HD field who are true uh, dedicated HD specialists. And I've just got to say, um, for uh, those investigators that have been around for several uh, decades, uh, when there truly was uh, no prospect of any therapy that could target the underlying cause of disease, it's really impressive uh, to see uh, the track record of these individuals and how long they've stuck around uh, to see uh, where, where this could go. And I think now it's not only us uh, at Roche Genentech, but there are many promising uh, approaches um, that are uh, in the clinic. And I think it's a very hopeful time uh, for individuals uh, and families living with HD. Um, of course, we have clinical trial networks. Um, we are privileged also to work with very powerful scientific and philanthropic organizations, such as the CHDI Foundation. Uh, we also work across with regulators in the HD Regulatory Science Consortium, uh, and, uh, and then, of course, advocacy uh, uh, with groups uh, like this very group uh, that's assembled today. I'd like to just uh, review uh, the history of, of the molecule and what it's been called. Uh, this investigational molecule was named by the uh, discoverers of the molecule, Ionis Pharmaceuticals uh, in Carlsbad, California, who are the pioneers of RNA technology. They've been at this uh, ever since it was just sort of uh, sketched on a paper before it existed. Uh, so we are very privileged to work with Ionis, uh, and they've uh, optimized this Huntington targeting therapy. Uh, when we opted into the program after Ionis generated the promising phase 1-2A results, showing for the first time that you could lower mutant Huntington in the CSF of patients with HD. We uh, rebranded this, uh, or, or rather renamed it RG6042, which is not, doesn't really roll off the tongue. Uh, so in order to uh, enhance communication, uh, this is now called Tominersen, uh, which is the international non-proprietary or generic name for this molecule. Uh, basically, the World Health Organization, when sponsors request, assign a unique name uh, to each uh, pharmaceutical substance. So I'll refer to the investigational medicine hereafter as Tom and Erson, uh, allowing for a clear identification and important for the communication, like I said. In terms of our approach, Huntington's disease uh, is caused by the mutant Huntington protein. This is uh, indisputable. Uh, this results from a genetic expansion, uh, which leads to Huntington messenger RNA that's then built into a Huntington protein. And when there are too many CAG repeats, uh, this protein can be in an expanded form and cause toxicity to the cells of the body, in particular the neurons in the brain of the body. And this can lead to cell damage, uh, which then ultimately can result with problems in thinking and planning, behavioral issues, movement difficulties, and ultimately untimely death. And so uh, what we're doing here is we are using Tominersen to interrupt the translation of the genetic product, the messenger RNA, by binding to the messenger RNA with Tominersen. And this hybrid shown in the middle of the slide then flags this messenger RNA for destruction before the protein can be made. And so this results in less protein overall being made as a function of how much Tominersen you give an individual. We do, we do so through targeting both of the non-expanded as well as the expanded alleles. And I'll tell you in the next slide why we chose that strategy. Essentially, this allowed us to look all up and down uh, the Huntington gene on both alleles to identify an ASO that was very potent and could have a strong effect on the Huntington protein. Because without a strong effect, you can't really um, have the, uh, a, a drug which may be able to do the job in terms of lowering the protein. So that was important to us. And it turns out that um, in, our, in our screens uh, that we were running, uh, we, the best one that we showed uh, we could identify uh, right before we got into the clinic was, was a non-allele or a, an a, a ASO targeting both the unexpanded and the expanded alleles. Now, um, the other consideration was uh, all things being equal, um, if you could take that approach, you could then treat all HD patients regardless of their individual genetic background, which was also an important consideration to us. Uh, and to show that this was very safe and tolerable across all animals studied uh, and in the uh, patients, um, that was a very important thing for us because also obviously without a safe medicine, 
um, you, you can't give it, even if it has a great effect on the protein. Uh, so this was our uh, general uh, considerations behind our non-allele specific approach or targeting both alleles. But that's not to say that other uh, companies that are going for the allele specific approach, such as WAVE, don't also have a very promising approach. Again, I think many of us uh, in the field are very optimistic about at least one of these uh, investigational medicines sort of punching through and having a good effect. Uh, so, so a lot of reason to hope. And we're also very happy and excited about our own approach too. Um, so Sarah mentioned this in some detail. I just wanna say a few words about the intrathecal injection. One obvious point, uh, if we could give this any other way, we would. Uh, if we could give it in a pill form, or even if we could give it with an IV, which is you know, easier than doing intrathecal, we would. Uh, but the only way to get antisense drugs into the brain is to give it directly to the fluid that surrounds the brain, which is why we need to do it through the intrathecal procedure or the spinal tap that Sarah outlined. Now, uh, basically, I, I wanna just say a couple of things of how this has gone from my perspective, looking across the global uh, sites. So we're in, a, we are in 18 countries at approximately 100 sites. We have done over 6,000 procedures in the Generation HD1 study. Uh, our average uh, time that somebody is on the table from when they lie down to when they get up is 15 minutes. Uh, and the complication rates coming from that over 6,000 procedure um, experience are about 10% rate of mainly mild adverse events, uh, things like a post-lumbar puncture headache or back pain. So this is looking very good uh, for chronic dosing, which is great news for the community uh, with certain individuals now being treated for up to three to four years with the ever, every other month administration. Uh, so that, that is all looking very promising in terms of the modality and how this um, uh, investigational medicine must be delivered. Uh, we think that also bodes very well uh, for other companies that are um, in this space using uh, this kind of approach. Uh, now onto the trials. So we are focusing presently on manifest HD, adults with manifest HD. We have done so because we believe these individuals can plausibly benefit and they have signs and symptoms which are readily measurable. So you can tell um, the effect of the investigational medicine over time. Without a clinical sign or symptom, it gets a little hard based upon the clinic to tell if a drug is helping you or not. So that's why we're focused here first. Um, these individuals are able to live at home, uh, but also may have minor difficulties with um, activities of daily living. Uh, but are basically able to care for themselves at home and have a lot of good function to preserve. Now, um, that said, uh, we certainly are well aware of the broader spectrum. Um, we are in active discussions about the optimal approach in pre-manifest for individuals have, who have yet to develop the motor uh, diagnostic uh, milestone of the diagnostic confidence level four. Um, we are uh, extremely interested in, in that uh, group because, of course, earlier intervention uh, would be even more promising in terms of preventing decline. I think that's what everybody hopes um, a Huntington lowering therapy could eventually be. Um, and in addition, of course, relevant to this group would be uh, pediatric HD or juvenile onset HD, as well as on the other end of the spectrum, late onset HD for individuals over age 60 who first develop signs and symptoms. I just wanna say about the pediatric HD and juvenile onset HD, we have an agreed upon investigational plan, but that plan is gated by the complete interpretation of the result of the Generation HD1 study. And the reason that is, is that we need to prove the principle we believe of the drug's action in individuals with HD from in, in this group prior to broadening it out to the broad groups, including pediatric HD and juvenile onset HD. And how we intend to study that group would be based upon a, a biomarker model where we could actually do a much smaller and efficient trial in pediatric and juvenile onset HD that's not based upon signs and symptoms because in the thinking of the proposal, uh, by understanding the relationships in manifest HD between changes in biomarkers and clinical outcomes, we could then use that knowledge to form a more efficient trial for pediatric HD or juvenile onset HD. But just to be very concrete, this would not start 
until the generation HD1 result is completed. Now I'll get into the details of generation HD1 and what we're looking at in terms of that uh, overall timeline next. So here's the overall program, uh, the phase 1-2A study that Sarah led that, um, oh, excuse me, just a bit of a slide jump there, uh, uh, that Sarah successfully led in the 46 uh, heroic individuals who volunteered for this first uh, ever experiment of a Huntington lowering drug. This study met all the marks on being uh, uh, a drug with a safe and, and a good tolerable profile, uh, very uh, good characteristics in terms of how long the drug was staying in the body and uh, the effects it was having on the mutant Huntington protein. And this led to a 15 month open label extension study uh, that has run to completion and is still incorporating uh, data from a newly validated uh, CSF mutant Huntington assay uh, and analyses uh, still ongoing from that. Uh, this is being also paired with an HD natural history study, which is studying individuals in the same target population or same characteristics of individuals as the open label extension. Uh, this is a study to further investigate the prognostic value or what happens to people clinically over time when they have a certain set of characteristics on biomarkers like CSF mutant Huntington at baseline. So if that level is higher, what does that say about how you do over time clinically? This is very much um, a study which we think we can gain a lot of interpretation and understanding of how biomarkers are important in HD. Um, and this will eventually, when it's complete, be pa uh, paired to the open label extension study. Now, uh, this study of uh, these, the only study in our, our uh, portfolio with, of the program here that has been impacted by COVID. Um, we were unable to complete um, the last um, several participants due to COVID uh, because most medical centers, um, when they had to choose what to do in the setting of COVID, chose active drug research or with a research with investigational medicines. So that meant a delay for our HD natural history study. We expect it to be complete over the next several months and look forward to um, those results um, later this year. Um, and uh, the happy news though, I guess of that is that the generation HD1 study, which is our phase three pivotal study, which I'll tell you more about in a minute, is a 25 month study in manifest HD population that I just explained. And this is designed to show and prove the long-term efficacy and safety of Tominersen in the manifest HD population. Uh, this study had a very temporary impact from COVID about a year ago in the first wave, but this was a very transient effect. And I must uh, say this HD community was incredibly strong uh, to band together, to sort of actively advocate and fight for the continuation of this study all around the world. And as a result of that effort, this study continued to run and quickly went right back up to about a 95%, 90 to 95% medication visit rate, um, which compared to other trial settings where adherence to like an oral medication may be less because it's hard to take a pill every day, we were right back up to 90, 95% by uh, the summer of last year. And we've stayed there to date. We're extremely happy with that. What that means is basically Generation HD1 can uh, stay its current length and can also run uh, to its current planned completion date, which is essentially one year from now. Uh, we'll be pulling down those results a little over one year from now, uh, and we'll know the answer from Generation HD1 relatively soon compared to sort of the multi-year setup and execution phase of a study. So that's very exciting for Gen HD1. And in the background, there's another study which is very science-y. Uh, this is the Gen Peak study. And this study is uh, measuring the time course of the effect on things like CSF mutant Huntington protein um, from the time that it's dosed all the way till when the drug is fully washed out of the system. Somewhat surprisingly, that's never been really done so carefully in ASO field. And we're uh, generating that knowledge, which we can then use to say, okay, what does that profile look like in terms of how safe the drug is? Or what does that profile look like in terms of how effective the drug is? This kind of detailed knowledge allows us to start playing those um, analytical tests out and seeing what the answers are. Now, Generation HD1, two active arms, uh, Tom and Erson, 120 milligrams every two months or every four months with placebo. And uh, this is in 791 participants um, who have manifest HD and who are independent at home, ambulatory, and who are verbal 
and who also have a CAP score of greater than 400 uh, with manifest HD. Now, this, this CAP score is basically an objective criterion we used. It's essentially a formula which calculates how long you've lived with your individual level of mutation burden. And then that number turns out to be very predictive of how you will progress over time on clinical and cognitive motor signs as well as function. And so that's a way of making the trial more efficient so that we can be sure we capture the signal. Because in order to see if a drug is slowing the decline, you need to also make sure that the in group of individuals who's taking the placebo show some change over time, because that way you can tell if the drug is effective or not. Um, so that's why we use the CAP score. Uh, we are in uh, 100 sites, as I mentioned, in 18 countries. Uh, this is going very well. Uh, we've enjoyed collaborations all around the world. And uh, in terms of uh, what we're really aiming for here is a two-year outcome on uh, two of those outcomes that Sarah mentioned, the total functional capacity scale and this UHDRS, the composite UHDRS. Um, and it's really all about how do people do over time? We think it's important to prove sustained and durable benefit risk uh, because there's a lot of questions around Tominersen. You know, it's targeting both alleles. Um, how do we know how we're dosing it? And so we think it's very important to get a long period of time uh, because that also gives you a better answer. There's more progression over time, a better signal to see if there's a difference. And also, in the first part of a trial, people can have a lot of expectancy about how they're doing because everybody is suddenly in the trial and thinking, oh, yeah. But really, what, you wanna, you, what you're interested in is how does the drug do really when it's no longer that excitement phase, really, as somebody's just coming in over that year to two year? Because then we can really say, you know, did this work or not? And that's why we feel good about the two year length. And the outcomes are really on the core of the functional motor and cognitive uh, measures that we think are relevant uh, to HD. That's shown here. And um, I will um, say that I realize I've taken probably more than my share of the time, and I want to leave time for discussion. Um, just to give a, give a call out to, to what Sarah, Sarah already showed, which is the HD monitoring platform, we're uh, big believers that there can be a lot of promising way to more sensitively detect a drug effect on cognitive or motor signs by using electronic measurement. And we are fully invested um, in this, uh, in our program. It's in every major study we are running and uh, we feel very good uh, about uh, the use of this technology uh, in our program. So with that, um, the phase three Gen HD one happy to give the good news that it is running on track for completion in a little over one year's time. Uh, we've made a lot of great progress. Uh, the community uh, engagement has been fantastic and critical. Um, and it's a very hopeful time. Like I said, there are many Huntington lowering therapies in development now uh, that hopefully at least one, if not more, let's see, uh, can help people. Um, and that's a huge thing. Um, and all data to date uh, from our end uh, continue to support our further clinical development of Tom Anderson and HD, which we are uh, waking up every day, very enthusiastic to do. So with that, thank you very much and happy with Sarah to take questions. Awesome. Well, thank you both. Uh, appreciate it. And I think we have about 15 minutes, so that's, that's perfect. And questions are coming in and we're going to do our best to, to answer them all. I mean, it's, it's always, it's always tough, right. To be able to answer all these questions, but um, you know, one, or, or I saw a few questions regarding, um, you know, when it comes to, I guess, access um, you know, one of it was talking about if the trial is successful, how accessible will the treatment be? And at what stage are you eligible for it? And I think that's also a good question also to think about for those that are in the pre-manifest stage, right? Are, are they going to get access to that perhaps too? And maybe when you can touch upon that. Well, I could just say briefly, um, you know, um, generally to, to, have that first step of access, you need to have a drug registered with the regulatory authorities. So in our context, if our generation HD1 study in a little over a year's time read out positive, we would take that evidence package to regulators for regulatory approval in the respective jurisdictions. And um, from that time point, uh, essentially Roche Genentech works as quickly as ever possible to promote broad access to the medicine. Now that doesn't mean 
and I, I'm I, I'm not on uh, the side that just is 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 in every jurisdiction to say this, yeah. but it doesn't mean everybody can have it at once. And it also means that it's generally available uh, first and foremost to the to the population that's been studied. Mm -hmm. But our strategy very much is to start to open up um, studies into this expand population, including pre manifest. Um, hopefully. Uh, in time enough so that there won't be a gap of access, you know, from like the adult manifest to the expand population. That's something very much on our mind. Um, but the short answer is, is as quickly as ever possible from registration. So if you, you know, look out at our timeline, you know, we're, we, I can't give you an exact, you know, crystal ball timeline of, course, of how yeah. we go because, you know, regulators could always say something too. But, you know, it's certainly not going to be in the too distant future, you know, post Gen HD1, if Gen HD1 is positive. If Gen HD1 is negative, I think it's more complicated because then you have to look into the trial and you have mm -hmm. to see, okay, was there something there that you believed there was a signal? You may actually have to do another study. You know, I think that would be a longer scenario for our program. And generally every company is kind of in the same situation. Like they've got to prove the point in a trial, bring it to regulators, get the approval, and then and then access starts, you know, basically from that shortly after that point. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's important to, to remind everyone of like, you know, it's, you know, doing the best we can, right. We can't, if, if we could, you know, speed it up, but we also have to make sure we're doing it effectively too, and, and making sure we're, we're crossing off each thing on the checklist. So that's definitely important. And um, kind of going off of that, um, you know, so, someone did ask, like, is there a prediction of what stages of, of the disease will patients be able to use the medication? So you know, again, I think it's going back to the advanced stages of HD versus maybe pre-manifest. You know, it's it's actually hard to say exactly how, like in certain jurisdictions, like if, if, if in the U.S. we had a label for Huntington's disease, you know, that's what the label said. You could see people taking interpretive license to say, okay, could that be, you know, somebody with pre-manifest? But I think the, the, the main message here to say is that our trial includes mainly stage one, stage two, a, a tiny bit of stage three. That would be the most obvious point where, where individuals could get access because that's who, who we're studying. Um, and I think it would, it, would be, it would be necessary to also do a study in the other populations in order for them to have access, yeah? And I don't think anybody's interested in doing a multi-year study you know, in pre-manifest if manifest works, because I think that then what we would think is that the biomarker changes that we're seeing would relate to positive outcomes. So maybe in pre-manifest, you don't have to go to the trouble of the multi-year clinical study. You could actually do a biomarker study and that would save time, you know, and that, that's sort of our clinical thinking on that one. Yeah. And I think going off of that, right, is, is understanding uh, for you know, we can talk just because we're HDO young adults, right? Especially those that might be at risk still or in that pre-manifest stage. And so like, you know, how do we, how do we make sure also one, I guess that it's not too much of a burden. I mean, if we look at it, right, if, if they're trying, if they're in college or, or career planning, and then they have to take like, you know, at least uh, six days out, out of the year off um, to participate in this plus follow-ups, right? How do we, how do we kind of look at it from that piece of it? And then um, how can young people help regulators understand the need of this? Yes. So, so I'm sorry, happy to, to yeah. Yeah, go. so I'm happy to add in there as well, Seth. So I think it's a really important question about how can you be in a trial and also live your, your life, if, especially if you're young, um, uh, HD gene carrier, um, and that's a really important group that, that uh, uh, we've been studying because um, in the HD young adult study, we know that, um, uh, that really that people function completely normally and well. And there was, uh, if there's an opportunity to treat very early when people are young, we may prevent this disease ever occurring and keep people functioning at a very high level. And I think one of the things that I think we will do as uh, uh, trials become available for people who are young, uh, uh, at risk or pre-manifest HD gene carriers, really very far from predicted onset, is that we'll start having to set up Saturday and Sunday 
clinics oh. and that we will then say you can come for your dose on a Saturday and then you can stay and then you go uh, we'll do Saturday and Sundays I think we're really going to have to be quite creative because we don't want people to have to give up 15 20 days a year um, when they're in the middle of college, for example. So the, I think that's how we will do that. We will plan for making trials adapt for people's lives. And I think, I think that's something that we will think about as we move forward uh, to make them, to make them um, uh, 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 fit with people's lives. When they're young, it's important. Yeah, I mean, and I think telehealth, we've seen how how positive it's been during this whole pandemic, right? So it's how do we add that into perhaps some of the trial, right, to make it uh, less less burdensome. So that's great. Yeah, absolutely. All our clinics now are video clinics. And yeah. so I think that's a way forward. Absolutely, Seth. Um, you know, we have a few questions regarding like if the HC community can help to ensure there are no barriers to access. Uh, if slash when it gets approved. Um, and then also, um, I guess, where will the treatment be available first? Per perhaps, again, hypothetically, um, like for example, worldwide, your Euro Europe and US, I know it probably depends on regulators and all that. So oh, I'm sorry, you which want one? to take that one? Yeah, no, sure. So which one first? Um, yeah, sorry. so maybe talk about, um, yeah. You know, if the HE community, what what perhaps we what can, you do, can do, do? Yes, to, okay. to, for so like any say, barriers to access. Yeah, yeah, I would say that um, my impression of this uh, community is that you are uh, extremely effective and powerful, and it's all about opening channels to make your voices heard. And and there's a lot of collaborative avenues uh, there as a drug is sort of um, you know on its way. Uh, to, to being, you know, uh, assessed by regulators. And I, I have, I'm very confident that, um, you know, and again, not only us at Roche, but other companies, our colleague companies that you've mentioned, Wave, PTC, Spark, Unicure, Voyager, all of those companies that are in the Huntington lowering field uh, can greatly benefit from what's, what is the obvious power of the voices of this community. And I think we just have to um, all kind of, um, you know, look at the evidence, right? And if we're convinced together as a community that something is looking good and working, I, I think we have the opportunity to, um, you know, we can do our part at Roche. Uh, you can do your part to, to work together to make sure patients have access. I and mean, it's in all of our interests. I think if there's a medicine with a positive benefit risk to, you know, get it out there. Um, so we're certainly steadfast partners with the patient advocacy community to, to, to make that happen. And I'm, I'm confident, you know, from what I've seen from, from all the organizations, yours, others, uh, that, that we can do this, you know, so I, I wouldn't worry that you're not doing the right things, you know, I think, you know, because because I think we're very much um, aligned and we, we have opportunities that we can use. Um, yeah. And we just have to stay in contact over those, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I mean, the other kind of part is like, you know, if the study goes well, right where will the treatment be available, right? Uh, first in Europe and slash the US or worldwide? It's hard to predict. I mean, drugs typically uh, do come on the market in the US followed by Europe, which can be a headache for all involved. Um, and I think our, our goal as a company would be to really get the drug uh, everywhere as fast as it could be, if it were effective. Um, there's no really no uh, picking favorites of jurisdictions. It's just, it sort of is a, a uh, function of the reality of how uh, countries are paced in terms of their regulatory apparatus, I would say. But you know, evidence gets submitted, uh, you know, usually uh, when it's positive as, as quickly as possible. You know, globally, um, doesn't always happen at the same time. But yeah, yeah. awesome. Um, a few more. So, you know, a few people were asking. I think just around like identifying trial sites, and so. How, how does a company identify those sites, especially if, you know, some people aren't in a country where there is a site, right? And, and how does that, how does that work? You know, uh, we, we seek out uh, top investigators who, who are presenting at conferences and thought leaders like Sarah Tabritzi, for example. And uh, those types of individuals like Sarah tend to be plugged in to HD networks of investigators. I think this is a very networked 
and highly interconnected uh, set of investigators in this community. So that's very helpful. So if you meet somebody like Sarah, I mean, through Sarah, I think I've met no fewer than probably 20 people who've been extremely helpful to our program. But beyond people like Sarah, I'd say from a company's perspective, um, advocacy groups, uh, foundations like CHDI and EHDN, they've been critical actually for us to understand how to operate um, as well as the Huntington study group on the North American side. You know, so we've worked with kind of EHDN slash CHDI for Europe and HSD slash, slash um, CHDI on the North American side. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how it works. It's just, you go to people who know what's happening on the ground. I think, you know, CHDI's Enroll HD network is also a very important, um, uh, uh, really a uh, gift, you know, to this community in terms of the knowledge that it's generating, but it also is helping trials, I'd say, yeah. Awesome, awesome. I'm trying to think of, got a few more. Um, so someone also asked, what about the form of administration of the treatment? Will there be, will there be a need for infusion centers in, in the countries that will receive it? This is a major issue. Um, and we are thinking a lot about how to do this and, and you know, I think Sarah, you could probably chime in on this, right? But I doubt that every single person who needed an IT could come to your center at UCL, you know, in, in your in your clinical suite, right? You, we're going to need more infrastructure, and that's something we're actively thinking about. And who can do this procedure, get credentials to to promote the uh, broad access goal, you know, when a drug is effective? And I, I will add to that. Actually, one of the things that we've been thinking about and relating to who does lumbar punches really at the moment, all the lumbar punches are done by doctors. And one of the things that I think is really important that we're going to do is um, if the drug is going to be more widely um, uh, available, if, if the Generation HD1 trial is successful, then we need to think about getting training nurses, very experienced nurses to deliver the drug. And we also need to think of a model where even uh, after a lot, uh, once patients have had the drug for a long period of time, whether nurses can even travel to patients' homes and do it. So I think that we have to think about changing the infrastructure to make it easier to have lumbar punches. And I think Jenna did ask a question about whether you can have an ultrasound for a lumbar puncture. And yes, yeah. you can. So if you have um, uh, any spinal problems or uh, difficulty with the lumbar puncture, it's not a problem to get an ultrasound and get it done under radiological guidance. And so I think we're gonna, we will plan for how we get the drug to people. And I think by using senior nurses, I think that's an important way forward. Nurses are underused and they're really important. And I think that's the way forward. Yeah, and, and kind of going back to just to wrap it all up is like, you know, your slides of, how you know patients are building trust and relationships with their neurologist or their their specialist, and so I think it just comes down to building that trust up with some of these nurses or uh, other people that can help be a part of this larger puzzle. So absolutely, yeah, I think it's very important. Is again that that trust and that open communication. So um, with that being said, you know, thank you both again for this very insightful session. Uh, I think it was definitely helpful and everyone appreciated it. Um, and, you know, now we kind of just to give everyone um, an idea of, of the rest of the, I guess, day, the next kind of sessions we have on track one, uh, you know, waves HD research update and then track two to learn what CHDI is, is up to um, in the space. So Thank you again, uh, Professor Sarah Tabrizi and Dr. Scott Schobel for helping out with this and taking the time to really inform the community about the updates and where we're at uh, with research. Well, Thanks thank so you. And uh, I want to just reiterate what Scott was saying. We're really honored uh, to be part of such an amazing community. HDO and all of you are really what keep everyone going. It's like Scott said, it's what gets you up in the morning and uh, it's what drives you through. So um, uh, keep doing what you're doing because the patients and families in this community are amazing. And uh, that's why, you know, that's why we're all doing this. This is why we get up in the morning. And so thank you. Awesome. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.